Yeah. And, you know, one of the kind of central questions in this book um, in Rediscovery of America is, you know, you write, how can a nation founded on the homelands of dispossessed indigenous people be the world's most exemplary democracy? Um, and you go on to sort of lay out uh, a framework of, you know, popular and academic histories about the United States, you know, specifically in the progressive vein, um, and looking at the so-called original sin and, and the founding of, of the United States and locating that within the institution of slavery. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that intervention and, and why it's important um, to add the kind of context of not only settler colonialism, but, you know, indigenous sovereignty. You know, I, I, I may feel a little sensitive to some of these um, observations at times because some initial reviews have drawn some attention to the fact that I'm trying to summarize really expansive scholarly fields um, in, in these kind of, I don't think of them as truncated, but in these somewhat brief ways. Um, and this wasn't intended to be a book that was written just for academics or even primarily for them. And so there aren't the, like, there are a lot of footnotes and things, but they're the kind of historiographical conversation or the sets of extensive literature reviews that um, one might find in a dissertation monograph or other. Um, I, I gestured rather than kind of filled this in. And so there is this kind of um, sense that very few, particularly the early American historians, are having that I'm castigating the field a little too heavily. But come on, this is Native American history. You know, how have you, we, how do you think we've been taught, uh, tra uh, how do you think we've been treated uh, over um, the history of American, like, st the history of American historical inquiry? Like, we have not been recognized as central subjects, Native peoples, right? So I don't think we can ever sufficiently remedy the form of exclusion that has occurred. And so, um, as you and I have, been in conversation about other in other times and places, uh, the words merciless Indian savages are in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and very few U.S. colonial historians or revolutionary historians can adequately explain even that subject matter. So uh, we have a long ways to go before we can feel comfortable about the current practice of American historical inquiry, I feel. And so uh, your question about, you know, trying to break out of the kind of binary black white paradigm um, is kind of, uh, I think it's potentially upsetting some because they've worked so hard to incorporate African American slavery into that narrative of America that they feel maybe insufficiently recognized or appreciated. Um, but basically, we can't, you know, as we all understand, think of these subjects um, in isolation. And so the history of indigenous both uh, peoples and subsequent dispossession need to be centrally factored into understandings of the evolution of the United States and its history in ways that we've done, been able to in certain ways with the history of African-American slavery. It'd be nice to see us move past these types of somewhat um, dualistic approaches and develop not necessarily a triangulated approach, but a more holistic and robust uh, kind of inclusionary paradigm of analysis that can talk about slavery and genocide or slavery and indigenous land theft or the expansion of slavery as uh, a aftermath or a product of the dispossession of or ethnic cleansing of indigenous peoples across much of the Southeast. Um, there, are, there are scholars, you know, you know many of them, and as do I, who are working towards these things, but I just think we have a long ways to keep going. Yeah, and so you're, you're working, and this is why I brought up the the sort of come to God moment in, in history, where it's like it's embraced, you know, certain kind of conventions, especially from African American history, and rightfully so. Um, but at the same time, it has, like you like you just, just said, it has this kind of black-white paradigm that isn't so much helpful in terms of understanding um, indigenous history uh, and indigenous history, you know, it, it, I don't think commits the same mistake in, in many ways of, of doing sort of a native white paradigm, but sometimes it can be, you know, it, when it, when it's done in, you know, in the, especially in the context of like settler colonialism, I've seen some, some studies that aren't necessarily um, holistic in the, in the sense that you're talking about. 
But the history that you lay out, I think, is incredibly important, um, especially that early, the early sort of American history um, and the foundings of the Constitution. And there's some really great, um, you know, lines in here. You basically, uh, I don't know the exact quote, but it's just to paraphrase you, you, you call like the Constitution as, as sort of this, this mechanism of westward expansion. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that because even in this moment in time, these, these questions are pressing and it seems like it's, oh, it's, it's ancient history or it's, you know, it's so far in the past. What does it have to do with the present? But again, going back to the, the recent ICWA, um, decision, you know, when you read like Neil Gorsuch's opinion and I, you know, I'm not trying to put you on the spot and cause I know you haven't read it, but he, he's very clear in saying that like the constitution doesn't limit tribal sovereignty at all. Um, and if you're a conservative, you know, constitutionalist and an originalist and a textualist, we actually don't really know, you know, we, we've been applying this constitutional principle without really understanding the history here. And this is 2023, right? Um, so it, it's the questions that you're looking at and examining, especially in that early period around uh, the American Revolution and the drafting of the Constitution hold weight today in the debates that are happening, you know, in the Supreme Court. And, and in many ways, they relate to the kind of failures of the binary racial paradigm for understanding historical injustice that uh, we were just kind of referencing or gesturing towards. Um, ICWA, which came out yesterday um, while I was off with, you know, my, my son doing some things, uh, I didn't have time to really fully digest. But I understand uh, that certain elements of the ruling um, have kind of upheld certain kind of doctrines, but others remain undetermined. And so mm -hmm. um, uh, there were, it was a 7-2 um, majority opinion written uh, by Justice Barrett. Um, and Gorsuch wrote a concurrence that Sotomayor and Jackson concurred to portions of. Right. So I think it's called part one. And so I just read the syllabus at the beginning. <laughs> but and the interesting thing that I haven't read and I'm kind of wanting to figure out is why Kavanaugh, right? Apparently Kavanaugh also wrote a concurring opinion that that laid that kept open this question of uh, kind of equal protections, right? And so the big question for that we are a lot of us are worried about um, with this case and potentially others that would be like them or like it would be the question of whether or not the Indian family or Indian hiring preference in Mankari or any type of kind of constitutional or legislative recognition of Indian distinctiveness is at odds with these equal protection concerns that come out of the 14th Amendment and other civil rights struggles for rights. And so if we think of individual rights as the only potential panacea for uh, forms of restorative justice, we're going to lose because Native peoples are not, as you know, and um, and as I write about, you know, not historically concerned about voting rights or, you know, um, uh, freedom of speech. You know, the concerns of like the Bill of Rights and having them applied to Indian country has not been a kind of historic concern. And, and when it has been, it's been relatively either recent and or kind of somewhat individualistic. Um, rather than kind of um, broad, uh, you know, rather than community based. So um, the Indian law policies have kind of fluctuated in part between accommodation and assimilation uh, uh, for so long because there's not a kind of clear alternative prescription or kind of constitutional place for Indian sovereignty as opposed to individual rights. And so right. we're seeing in a sense, a struggle between kind of visions of constitutional distinction in which individuals are suing essentially um, legislative remedies for histories of abuses that communities need to protect themselves and their families and their children. So um, it's a really interesting, but also kind of troubling space because so many are unable to see alternative forms of, of kind of political activity or, um, a constitutional distinction. So I'm really excited um, to that many more people are having these conversations. It took me a really long time in my life and career to make sense of them myself, uh, partly because I'd never been to law school. I don't really, um, 
you know, um, understand certain principles, but it was only through teaching a class uh, called American Indian Law and Policy that over time, I kind of felt like I needed to understand this stuff to be able to teach it. And now I've written a little bit about it. Um, and I'm still trying to work towards these things, but the kind of technical doctrinal uh, questions sometimes, like this case was also about what's called anti-commandeering, whether the federal government mm -hmm. has the ability to compel states to do certain things. Uh, lots of kind of technical stuff that um, uh, I'll have to kind of sit down with and read more than once to make sense of uh, 